Hello and welcome to the last lecture for this week. In this lecture, we're going to talk about proving if and only if statements, and then we're going to talk about proof by induction. Okay, so let's jump right in. If I give you an if and only if statement and ask you to prove that it's true, how would you do that? Well, consider the following if and only if statement. Propositions P and Q. To prove P if and only if Q, I need to show two things. One, P implies Q, and two, Q implies P. Sounds straightforward, but a very common mistake that students make is only proving one direction and not the converse direction. And if you were to do that on an assignment, you would lose a bunch of marks. So do make sure that you're explicitly proving both directions. Or if it is possible, and in some cases it is, to prove both directions at one time, make sure you comment that your proof is sufficient for both directions. So now let's examine a few examples. Prove that for all x and r, the absolute value of x is equal to 3, if and only if x squared is equal to 9. Okay, so instead of first doing the scratch work and then giving you a formal proof, I'm just going to jump straight into the formal proof. So we need to show two things. If the absolute value of x is equal to 3, then x squared is equal to 9. And if x squared is equal to 9, then the absolute value of x is equal to 3. So to prove the forward direction, and you can use this notation if you want, uh, we let x be a real number such that the absolute value of x is equal to 3. So now, what does it mean if the absolute value of x is equal to 3? Well, that just means that x is equal to plus or minus 3. And now, if I take plus or minus 3 and I square them, well, I just get 9. Thus, the desired statement holds. To prove the converse direction, and again, you could just use this arrow in your formal proofs, we assume that x squared is equal to 9. So now that I have this expression, what can I do with it? Well, I can solve it. So taking the square root of both sides yields that x is plus or minus 3. Well, now if I take plus or minus 3 and take the absolute value of it, I just get 3. Thus, the converse direction holds as well. Now, comment on the formal proof. Technically, you can get away without writing this, but I just stuck it here since it was the first formal proof, and I want to make it very, very clear that you do have to prove these two statements, and I wanted to make it clear precisely what I'm proving down here. But in your own work, feel free to not state this and start by proving the forward direction and the backwards direction, if you wish. So now I'm going to introduce the principle of mathematical induction. Before I do this, I want to formally define what an axiom is so that I can introduce the principle of mathematical induction in a more proper way than just throwing it at you. So an axiom of a mathematical system is a statement that is assumed to be true. So an important thing for axioms is that no proof is given. I just say this is true. Examples of axioms are things like one is a number. For any given number, I can add one to that and get a new number. Parallel lines do not cross. Those are the type of statements that I usually take as axioms. So from axioms, we then derive propositions and theorems. So in mathematics, the propositions and theorems that we prove are true if and only if the axioms that we assumed to be true hold. So that's one of the limitations of mathematics. The other limitation I won't get much into, but you can prove that there are statements in mathematics that you cannot prove. Okay, so now that I know roughly what an axiom is, let's introduce an axiom. Axiom, the principle of mathematical induction, or P-O-M-I if you wish. Let P of N be a statement that depends on N in the natural numbers. If both, one, P of one is true, now this statement is referred to as the base case, and if the statement for all K and N, if P sub K is true, then P sub K plus one is true, and this statement is known as the inductive step, then I can conclude that statement three is true, that for all N and N, P of N is true. Now, that's a lot to kind of swallow. Let's think about what this is really saying. To do this, let's think of the analogy of dominoes. If I have, say, a bunch of dominoes and I want to knock them all down, how can I do this? Well, first, I need to knock down the first domino. And if it so happens that further down the line, if I pick an arbitrary domino, say, Fred here, and if Fred being knocked down implies that the next domino, say, George, is knocked down, and if that holds for any domino that I pick, then I will knock all of the dominoes down. That's the idea of what, we're, what we have here. So for dominoes, I first need to knock the first domino down. And then if each domino knocks down the next domino, then all of them will fall down. 
So now to go kind of abstract for a minute, the reason why I need to take this as an axiom is, well, if I had a finite number of dominoes, it's obviously true. But if I had an infinite amount of dominoes, how can you guarantee that that will always work no matter how far you, you go down the chain? Well, we really need to take it as an axiom. So one very common point that students miss, you must show that both one and two hold. And in your formal proof, I really want to see you say base case, prove it, inductive case, prove it. You'll see that in the formal proofs that we cover in a bit. Now let's look at an example of using the principle of mathematical induction to prove a statement. Prove that the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of this product here is equal to this statement on the right hand side for all natural numbers n. So here I'm really assuming you know summation notation. Uh, if you don't or if you have any questions on it, ask on Piazza or office hours and I can elaborate in much greater detail. So the base case, what would the base case be for this problem? Well. The smallest n can be is 1. So what's the base case? The base case is the sum from 1 to 1 of this term is equal to precisely this expression here when I plug in 1. So when I plug in 1 to here, I get 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 2. So is this true? Well, yes. So we note that the sum from i is equal to 1 to 1 is, well, when I just plug in 1 into here, I get 1 times 1 plus 1, which is just 2. And this is in fact equal to this step here. So next we need to prove the induction step. So what is the inductive step? Well, the inductive step is if this statement here were to hold for say some integer k, then that would imply that it holds for k plus one. So to be explicit, if for some k in the natural numbers, this sum is equal to the right hand side, then the sum when I change the top index to k plus one, is equal to the right hand side when I substitute k plus 1 in for n. So here I just change this to k plus 1 and here the n becomes a k plus 1, n plus 1 becomes k plus 2, and n plus 2 becomes n plus 3. So this is what I need to prove. I assume this and I have to show that. So how do we do this? Well in general it will depend quite a bit on the particular problem that you're asked to prove, but let's show how you would do it for this particular problem. Well, again, we assume for some k that this holds. So now, how can I turn this left-hand side into the right-hand side that I had here? So pause the video and think about that for a second. Okay, so the difference between this sum and the sum over here is that this sum has the extra term k plus 1 times k plus 2. So I can just add that term to both sides of this equation. So adding the k plus 1 term explicitly k plus 1 times k plus 2 to both sides gives me, well, on this side, I can simply absorb this extra term into the sum by changing the index. And on the right-hand side, I have this term here, which is simply this, plus my extra term. So now I need to do some algebra to show that this term here is simply equal to this expression here. So explicitly, I now need to show that this side here is simply equal to this expression here. Well, there's lots of ways you could do that. I could algebraically manipulate this side to turn it into the right-hand side, or I could simply expand both hand sides by multiplying everything out. If I multiply everything out, I find that both the left-hand side and the right-hand side are equal to this polynomial, which proves the statement that I wished to show. Now, since I'm going to be asking you to formally use mathematical induction to prove things, Let's give the formal proof for this statement and go through all the gritty details for the structure that I want you to use in your proofs. So we use mathematical induction on n, where p of n is this statement. Okay, so in my statement to mathematical induction, I talked about that piece of n. In your proof, you need to formally define what piece of n is. So make sure you do that. Next, I prove the base case. So for the base case, for this case, I could simply say, note that this is equal to this expression, which is equal to the right-hand side. That's just the algebra that I did before, so I don't need to go into the details here. Thus, since this holds, p of 1 is true. So now let's look at the inductive step. So let k be an arbitrary natural number and assume the inductive hypothesis, this. So in your formal proofs, just to be careful, you can directly just plagiarize this statement here and use it, and then state whatever the inductive hypothesis is. 
So now that I've stated what the inductive hypothesis is, I do whatever algebraic or mathematical things I need to do to show that the inductive hypothesis implies the inductive conclusion. So for this case, I simply add k plus 1 times k plus 2 to both sides, and this yields that the sum from i is equal to 1 to k plus 1 of this term here is just simply equal to the sum from i to k of this plus my extra term. I now can explicitly use my inductive hypothesis to write that this sum here is simply equal to this expression here, which gives me this term there. And now I can simply expand this term by noting that since this thing is equal to this expression here, which is equal to this expression here, then the proposition is true for n is equal to k plus 1. And hence my proposition holds for all n in the natural numbers by the principle of mathematical induction. So one comment on the form of my proof here, if you formally wanted to, you could jump directly from this equality here to this equality on this side. I just split it up so it would fit on slides. Okay, let's give you one more example of the principle of mathematical induction to anchor things down a little bit more. So prove that for all positive integers n greater than or equal to 4, n factorial is greater than 2 to the n. So what is my base case for this example? Well, it'll be that 4 factorial is greater than 2 to the 4th. Is this true? Well, yes, 24 is greater than 16. So now notice that k is equal to 1 is not the base case for this problem. I'm starting with 4. The principle of mathematical induction works as long as you start at some arbitrary integer and want to prove the statement for every single integer greater than that arbitrary integer. It does in fact work for more general cases than that, but I digress. So now I need to show the inductive step. So what is the inductive step? So pause the video for a second and go through and see if you can think what the inductive step would be for this problem. Well, in this case, for the inductive step, we simply need to show that if k factorial is greater than 2 to the k for some k and n with k greater than or equal to 4, then k plus 1 factorial is going to be greater than 2 to the k plus 1. So notice that this restriction on k explicitly comes for our restriction on n in the proposition we want to prove. So now, how do we go about proving this? Well, first we assume the inductive hypothesis. So we assume that k factorial is greater than 2 to the k for some k and n with k greater than or equal to 4. So now that we have this step, I need to prove that my inductive conclusion holds from this. So how can I go from this k factorial to this k plus 1 factorial? Well, I can multiply by k plus 1. So multiplying by k plus 1 gives that k plus 1 factorial is equal to k plus 1 times k factorial, just definition of factorial from your previous mathematical work. And by my inductive hypothesis, this k factorial is going to be greater than 2 to the k. So explicitly here, this assumption. So now what do I know about k plus 1? Well, I know k is greater than 4, therefore k plus 1 will simply be greater than 2. And now I can use my exponential rules to rewrite this as 2 to the k plus 1. So I have in fact proven that k plus 1 factorial is less than my 2 to the k plus 1. Now let's look at the formal proof for this. So how would we write our formal proof? Well, we first need to state what we're doing. We use the principle of mathematical induction on n, where p sub n is the statement that n factorial is greater than 2 to the n. So now we consider our base case. Well, our base case is the case where n is equal to 4. And now we can simply state why the n is equal to 4 case is true. Well, 4 factorial is 24, which is greater than 16, which is 2 to the 4th. Therefore, p sub 4 is true, and thus the base case holds. So now we need to do the inductive step. So again, let k greater than 4 be an arbitrary natural number, and assume that k factorial is greater than 2 to the k. Okay, so now we just do the algebra that we did before, and we could just simply say multiply by k plus 1 gives this expression here. Now I might want to give an argument as to why this is equal to k plus 1 factorial, so we can do this by simply saying by definition this expression here is equal to k plus 1 quantity factorial, and now we can continue with the rest of our algebra. So since k is greater than 4, k plus 1 is greater than 2, and thus this is going to be greater than 2 times 2 to the k, which is simply 2 to the k plus 1. So putting all of this together would give us that k plus 1 factorial is greater than 2 to the k plus 1, and thus p of k plus 1 is true, and by the principle of mathematical induction, p of n is true for all n greater than or equal to 4. So just last comment on the formal proof for mathematical induction. Note the language I use, this first sentence here, 
this sentence here where I say what my base case is, and this sen sentence here where I let k be within the domain that I'm considering and assume my inductive hypothesis. And finally, this last statement here where I explicitly say, by the principle of mathematical induction, p sub n is true. Uh, those are all very good phrases to use, but the main thing I'm looking for is for you to explicitly split up the base case and the inductive step and to show both of them. So if you have questions on the form of these proofs, ask in Piazza or that honestly would be done better in office hours. And I'm sure more than one student will have a question on the general form for a proof by mathematical induction. So ask away. Okay, so finally, I want you to read the proofs for claims 9 through 12 on pages 24 to 30. I highly suggest you go through the formal proofs for these uh, claims because it'll give you some more examples of how to formally write a proof for mathematical induction. So in the assignments, I am expecting a formal proof for mathematical induction, so keep that in mind. And now you can get this mean, well, mostly, when you have to prove something for all n and z, use induction. So here, we only showed induction for n in the natural numbers. So this meme is saying that it works for n in all of the integers. Is that true? Yes. Why? Well, I'll talk about that a little bit when talking about cardinality. I won't get into the details, but once I discuss the cardinality of sets, feel free to remind me that I made this comment that I would elaborate on this meme. Okay, that's it for our lectures for this week. Again, if you have any questions, I have my office hours. They're listed in the weekly schedule, and you can feel free to ask any questions you want on Piazza. This material is a bit more abstract, so definitely ask questions if you need something clarified. So I wish everyone a good weekend, and you will listen to more of my recordings on Monday.